be seated. We often just try to leave room for various things in our lives, like creamer in our coffee, events on our calendar, and space in our garage. But leaving room doesn't guarantee we will end up with enough creamer, the right events, or enough space. What if, instead of just leaving room, we actively make room for the important things and for what truly matters? Well, good morning. So as you heard, we've been talking about making room. There's a big difference between making room and leaving room. So we've been talking about making room for things that are important. Like we started talking about making room for the new. So if we want the new, we have to let go of the old. That could be a hurt, a habit, a hang up, but it could also be something that's easy, comfortable, known and letting go of those things to grasp onto the new. We talked about making room for relationships, real relationships, like not just transactional relationships, but deep rooted relationships that bring us to the feet of Jesus and going deeper in those relationships. Let me just offer this to you. Uh, If you're seated there in the seat back in front of you, there's what we call a connect card. If you're looking to go deeper in relationships, if you want a Paul in your life, a Timothy in your life, if you just want a group, you want to start a new group, you want a group in your home, whatever, if you would just fill out that connect card and let us know that, we will follow up with you and we will help you take that step uh, into a deeper relationship. You can just leave it with us in the black give boxes on your way out this morning. Last week, we talked about making room for giving And look at this, you all came back. Isn't that fantastic? That's amazing. So uh, we talked about giving our time, our talent, and our treasure. And if we don't make a conscious decision to do those things, we'll just leave room and it will never happen. We have to make room, which by the way, I talked about the giving boxes. So if you have a physical gift that you want to leave with us this morning, you can do that, or you can go to aldersgate.online or info. You can find out how to give there. But even more than that, your time and your talent. If you're looking to take that next step in giving time or talent here at the church, outside the walls of the church, take that connect card. Let us know. I don't even know what I want to do. I just want to give away. Put it down there. We will follow up with you. We will help you take that next step. This morning, we are going to talk about the greatest thing, the greatest person we have to give, and that's Jesus. And I want to talk about making room for offering Jesus. God gave us time, talent, and treasure, but the greatest gift of all is Jesus. And he wants us to give him away. 1784, John Wesley commissioned Thomas Cope to come to America to ordain a gentleman named Francis Asbury who would begin the Methodist movement in the New World and begin to organize the Methodist church in the New World. And standing on the pier of the River Avon as he sent out Coke and his party, he gave them one simple charge. Offer them Christ. It's so, it seems like, really, we're going to talk about that for 20 minutes today? Yes. Because we desperately want to make the world a better place, do we not? We, we want to leave the world a better place when we leave than it was when we came into the world. And so because of that, we're all about love and compassion. And we're all about making sure we fight against uh, systems that uh, bring about oppression or, or prejudice. And we want to make sure that we work to make society fair and just. But listen, if we do all of those things without offering Christ, we're just a social agency, a political activist group. It's all about offering Christ. Listen, love and compassion are great. Fair and just society is great. Fighting against oppression and prejudice is great. But Jesus is the only one who brings about true life change and transformation. And we've got to be about the business of offering Jesus 
to the world. So we're going to wrap up this message series by talking about offering Jesus. I'm going to do it out of Acts chapter 3. So if you've got a Bible with you, a Bible app on your phone, if neither of those, reach down there in the seats in front of you and grab a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 3. While we've been in this message series, we've been talking about, or not talking about, we've been reading through the book of Acts. And so if you've been reading through the book of Acts with us and you're not an overachiever, today you should be on Acts chapter 22. You'll finish Acts this week. Next Sunday, we'll give you a brand new reading plan. We're going to read through the Gospels in 60 days. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll tell you more about that next week. But Acts chapter 22 today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 3. Listen, if you haven't joined us, just join in this week. You can read all 28 chapters of Acts this week. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read out of the English Standard Version of the Bible. Here's what it says. Now, Peter and John, We're going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Just a couple of things here I want you to notice. Number one, Peter and John, they were real friends. Not deal friends. They were real friends. They understood what it meant to make room for relationships. And they were on their way to church. They they had this rhythm built into their lives. This is even before Jesus, but they had this rhythm built into their lives where they went to the church to pray at certain times of the day. If they weren't in Jerusalem, they didn't live there, then they they had a prayer closet or they had something in their home uh, or wherever it was where they would stop every time during these regular times and they would pray. And so Peter and John, this is important. I want you to grasp this because they're on their way to church. Verse two, and a man lame... Well, that doesn't mean that he was just not, I mean, that means he was like physically uh, handicapped, okay? So, uh, a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms. That's offerings, money. He was asking for money. Uh, in first century culture, those who had a physical disability, the only way they couldn't work, the only way that they had to feed themselves uh, was to beg for money. And so this is what he's doing. Verse 3, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Let me say that again. Walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Jesus, may we be filled with that same wonder and amazement at what you want to do in us and through us today by offering you. God, we thank you for your word. We believe it's your inspired word. We believe it's the ultimate authority over our lives. And God, we believe that those who hear and obey will find true life change and transformation. Those who make room for you, make room for offering you, find true life change and transformation. So may we see that today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want us to look at the characters in the story, and I know everybody wants to go to Peter and John because everybody wants to be Peter and John in the story, but first of all, can we just be lame? Some of you are like, yeah, easier for you than others, right? But can we just be lame? And I want us to recognize in the story that all of us can relate to the lame beggar. In fact, all of us are the lame beggar. Beggar. I'm going to walk you through this. I want to show you how we are identical to this lame beggar. Number one, he was born lame. You and I are born lame as well. Now, here's the word for lame. Broken, messed up, don't have it all together. We call it original sin in theological terms, but it means that we were born into a broken, messed up world that doesn't have it all together. And being born into that world as people of this world, we are also broken, messed up, don't have it all together. Any amens from that? 
right? We call it original sin. Let me give you a scripture. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. This is Paul. Here's what he says. Just as sin came into the world through one man, who is that? Adam, Genesis chapter 3. Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. Now the ladies are like, well, I'm not lame then. In the Bible, first century, when it was written, men meant all people. Okay? Paul's saying all of us were born into this broken, messed up, don't have it all together world because all of us are born in the same position. Messed up, don't have it all together, broken people. We are all born lame just as this man was. Here's another thing we have in common with him. He was poor. Now you're like, okay, now I'll preach it. I can relate to this one, right? He was poor and he was begging for money. Let me, let me say it this way. Here's how we are like this man. We all have a debt we can't pay. Here, let me give you scripture. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. This is Paul again. And he says, And you who were dead in your trespasses. Trespasses is a fancy word that shows up in other places than the Lord's Prayer. Okay. And so what it means is broken, messed up, don't have it all together. Okay, And we, who were dead in our trespasses, watch this, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, watch, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. That's what, when Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished, that's literally what it means. I have paid your debt in full. We are just as poor as this man was in Acts chapter 3. Let me give you another one. He was outside the temple. Did you catch that in the story? He didn't beg inside the temple. They laid him outside the temple at a gate called the Beautiful Gate. Isn't that ironic? And he was begging for money there, and he had a habit of being placed by the same gate, begging in the same place every day, multiple times during the day as people went into the temple, but he was not in the temple. Now, here's why that's important, because in the first century, Jesus, well, God's presence was believed to dwell in the temple. So what does that mean? He was separated from God's presence. Can I share a scripture with you? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. That means being with God's people and being in his presence. Strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in this world. We too were separated from God. We were broken. We had a debt we couldn't pay. And because of that, we were separated from God's presence. Now, can I give you some good news in a way that we're like this man? He was healed. He was healed. He was completely restored. He went from not being able to walk and begging. Scripture says he stood up, leaped, and praised God. You and I have been healed as well. Can I give you a scripture? I'm going to anyway. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For by grace... You have been saved through faith. You couldn't do it. You couldn't earn it. You're too broken, messed up, don't have it all together. But because of grace, Christ's riches at God's, uh, our, God's riches at Christ's expense, because of that, we were saved. This is not our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, those four things, I can say without a doubt, we are just like the lame man. We are just like the lame beggar. There's a fifth one I want to share. And this one, I can't say for sure if we are just like him. Because it depends on our response to the gift that's been given to us. Scripture says that he walked, leaped, and praised God. 
are you? Like we've been healed and because of that, are we living in our healing? Are we living in our freedom? Are we praising God? That choice is up to us whether we are like the lame man in the story or not. So the question this morning is, who's offered Jesus to you? And who are you offering Jesus to? So, I want us to look at three things really quickly that we find in the story of how we can offer Jesus to others so that we can be in a community of people who walk, leap, and praise the Lord. Sounds good, right? One person. All right, you're with me. Okay. So for you, I'm going to keep going. Three things. Let's make these prayers. Prayer number one. May we pray that we see people. All right, I want you to see something in Acts chapter 3, verse 3. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, verse 4, and Peter directed his gaze at him. Don't miss that. Peter directed his gaze at him. Don't miss it. Here's why. This man was brought by other people to the same place on the road that goes into the temple, same time every day to beg for alms. Can you imagine all the people going to church and not stopping to see this man? Let's get to the healing part. No, no, no. Let's first get to the part where Peter and John looked him in the eyes. They saw him. He had people walk past him every day, sometimes the same people every day that never stopped to look him in the eye, never saw him. May our prayer be, God, help us see the people you put in our path every day. We are so about the destination. We got to get here. We got to get here. We need to be here. We need to be here. I got to make sure I get to get them here. I need to be here during this time. We are so concerned about the destination. How many people do we miss on the way to the destination? That we need to stop and look into their eyes. Peter and John were on their way to church. All right, I'm going to meddle just a little bit. How many people did you pass by this morning on the way to church? The barista? The person who handed your donuts out of the drive-up window? The clerk at the convenience store? The waiter or waitress, if you've already had breakfast out this morning. The person that you gave the finger to on the loop. (laughs) May we pray that we would see people the way Peter and John saw this man. This past fall, I preached through a message series called Good God Gospel, talking to us about how to have good conversations that turn into God conversations that ultimately turn into gospel conversations, offering Jesus to people. How many people do we pass by in our house, in our workplaces, in the places where we learn, in the places where we play? Sometimes we see them every day, multiple times a week, and we've never thought to stop and look them in the eye and have a good conversation that might turn into a God conversation that might turn into a gospel conversation. May we pray that we would see the people that Jesus wants us to offer himself to. Second thing may we pray, may they see us. Look at verse five. And he, now we're back to the lame man, Peter and John looked him in the eye. Verse five says, and he fixed his attention on them. Now think about it. He laid in the road every single day. People passed him every single day, sometimes the same people every single day, never stopping to look at him. After a while, don't you think it got hard for him to look at others? Even when he held out his cup, to beg for money? Don't you think he held it out like this with such shame and disgrace he couldn't even look up at people in the face? But here he is, looking back at Peter and John. 
And I think our next prayer needs to be, may they see us. More specifically, may they see Jesus in us. Listen, church, here's what I believe. I believe the world is looking at the church. I believe the world is looking at Christ's followers. There are some baby boomers in the room. That's a nice way of saying there are some older people in the room. And the baby boomer generation, the cool thing to do is go to church. That was the cultural thing to do. Everybody went to church. I see some millennials and generation Zers in the room. Listen, your culture, it's not the cultural thing to go to church. So if you're here, I am so glad that you're here because you want to be here. And your generation is looking to the church and looking to Christ followers. Why? Because everything else they've looked to has left them empty. Everything else they've looked to has disappointed them. And Jesus is the only one who won't disappoint. But listen, I'm afraid when they look at us, they're looking for that same disappointment. Why? Because that's sometimes what the church and Christ followers have given them. And the reason the church and Christ followers have given them that is because... (laughs) We're not offering them Jesus. We're offering them something that may temporarily make their situation better. I have a buddy who started playing golf, and uh, he wants to get better at it. And so he hired a pro to give him a few lessons. And he tells a story about the meeting the pro for the very first time and getting his first golf lesson from a golf pro. And when he first met her, here's what she said to him. What would you like for me to do for you? And he said to her, I just want to suck less. I'm afraid, church, sometimes when people look at us and they're looking for Jesus, we give them something that just helps make their situation a little bit better temporarily, but we don't offer Jesus to them who can bring true life change and transformation. That's why we're spending a whole Sunday talking about offering Jesus because he's the only one who can change forever. Dr. Lesore, he's an Old Testament theology professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. Here's what he says. It's not the church's business in this world to simply make the present condition more bearable. The task of the church is to release here on earth the redemptive work of God in Christ. Are we offering the redemptive work of God in Christ to a world who is looking to us, church, or are we simply offering something to make the present condition more bearable? There's also a story told, I don't know if it's true or not, it's been repeated for years, about a humble monk and a Catholic cardinal back in the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages, by the way, if you don't know church history, the church was at its like most magnificent in terms of like buildings and authority and influence in the world. And this cardinal and this monk are walking together one day and the cardinal says to the monk, We no longer have to say, silver and gold I do not have. And the monk replied, but neither can you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. I think the question for us, when people look back at us, the world looks back at us, are we saying, silver and gold, here you go, I can make your situation better for a while. Or are we saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Are we offering Jesus? Which is the third prayer. Let's just make this our prayer. Verse 6. I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You know, the disciples had been given that authority by Jesus. Jesus had given them the authority and power to heal. In fact, I'm going to show it to you. Luke chapter 9. 
It's going to be up on the screen. Jot this down. I'm fixing to take you through uh, seminary in five minutes, all right? Luke chapter 9, verse 1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. Look at verse 6. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Like this wasn't just mental gymnastics. Jesus said, I'm giving you power and authority. And guess what the disciples did? They walked in that power and that authority. They shared the gospel and they healed people everywhere. Now, I know this is Luke chapter 9 and Jesus is speaking directly to the disciples. And so what he said to the disciples, it has to mean to the disciples. But listen, you know what a disciple is? It's a follower of Jesus. So those of us in this room who are followers of Jesus, do you know that we've been given the same power and authority? This is where you say amen. Amen. Those of us that follow Jesus have been given the same power and authority. Listen, I know this may get a little dry, but I'm going to take you on this journey because you need to see it. Write these down and study them this week. Acts chapter 1, 8. But you, who's you? Followers of Jesus. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will receive this power. John chapter 16, verse 7. Here's what it says. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, a.k.a. the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will give you power. And authority, John chapter 14, verse 12. Here's what Jesus said. I say to you, catch this, whoever believes in me. There's no exit clause there. Whoever believes in me. That means if you're sitting in this room or watching online and you say, I believe Jesus is who he says he is and he did what he said he did, this applies to you. You will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will you do. Why? Because now he's giving the power to all of us who believe. We have that power and authority. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. This is Paul speaking again. He says, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who, what? Believe according to the working of his great might. This is not our power. According to the working of his great might that he, this is so rich, you've got to get this, listen. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Do you grasp what Paul is saying? Paul is saying that the power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead is available to you. Now, let me ask you, are you offering Jesus to people? In that power? working at you, doing greater works than Jesus did because it's now in you, it's in all of us. Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we would ask or think, here it is again, according to the power at work in us. Now, I I know probably what some of you are thinking and probably what some of you would say back to me if I gave you the opportunity. Well, I'm just not sure we see miracles today like we did in the Bible. Fair enough. Here would be my question back. Are we offering Jesus to people like they did in the Bible? Because I believe Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And we offer the same Jesus to people that Peter and John offered. And if we're offering the same Jesus, we're going to see the same power. But instead, we've been offering something to make the present condition more bearable. So who offered Jesus to you? And who are you offering Jesus to? The band's going to come back out. I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite the altar ministry team to the front. And we're just going to take a time of offering Jesus. I'm offering Jesus to those of you 
who've been struggling with a hurt, a habit, or hang up, and maybe you've been offered something to make it better just for a temporary time. When Jesus wants to give you true healing, transformation, and freedom. I'm offering Jesus to those of you who've been stuck in relationships or your marriage is on the rocks or you're in some place like that in a relational circle and you've been given something by the church maybe to just make it better for a temporary time. But Jesus wants to give you true transformation and healing. I'm offering Jesus to those of you who've been stuck in a physical health situation or a mental health situation or a spiritual health situation. And maybe you come on Sundays and you hear and you leave and for the next half day or day, because you've been in the presence of the Holy Spirit, life is better. But you don't experience true transformation and change. Listen, I'm giving an invitation today for those of you who've asked and asked and asked that you would have the boldness to ask one more time today. So the altar ministry team will be here. The altar's open. If you need to come and receive the Jesus that's offered to you, come. Listen, I'm also gonna extend this invitation. If you're here and you've been interceding for someone else, Maybe they're here in this room and you need to go grab them and bring them to the altar. Maybe they're not here and you just need to come to the altar and lift them up in prayer, offering them Jesus. Remember, we can identify with this lame man in lots of different ways. The choice as to whether we identify with him in our walking, leaping, and praising is up to us. I've been praying all morning. I know God's presence is here but I've been praying that we would see his manifest presence, meaning that we would surrender to the Christ that's offered to us and that we would see walking and leaping and praising God because we're no longer putting a Band-Aid on something. We're finding true life change and transformation. So God, that's our prayer. May the Holy Spirit fall so powerfully on us we know that you're looking at us today may we have the courage to look up at you and that the power that you have to offer us in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit that we would see walking leaping and praising God.